Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Thank you for taking time out and being with us today. My name is Selin Özbek Çitone. I'm the Data Protection Partner at Özbek Attorney Partnership. I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. As Özbek Attorney Partnership and KP Data Consultancy, we have been uh, we have started a series of panels under the name of KP Talks, where we discuss data protection and cybersecurity related topics with experts. This is our seventh panel. We are very excited uh, that you have joined us today. We will be discussing artificial intelligence in practice. Um, a recorded version of this webinar will be available on our uh, LinkedIn websites. Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, but feel free to uh, share your questions on the, um, on the chat boxes or on other venues. We are live on, uh, on LinkedIn as well. So uh, please uh, share your questions anytime you want. So let me start off introducing our amazing speakers today. Uh, we have all female panel of speakers, uh, and I'm so happy uh, that we are together. Um, our first speaker is Lara Liguori from Portolano Cavallo, uh, law firm in Italy. Uh, and the second speaker is Dr. Vera Junking from Hengelheim Müller Law Firm in, Ge uh, in Germany. And the third speaker is Associated Professor Elif Kizeci from Bahçeşehir University in Turkey. Welcome all. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to have you here today. Um, can I um, ask you to introduce yourself to our audience? Laura? Yes, okay, okay. yes, yes, mm -hmm. I, I can. I am, uh, yes, um, first of all, thanks very much, Celine, for inviting me to this panel. Um, I'm very happy and, and I agree with you. It's very happy to be, you know, all women, you know, on on these topics. I'm a partner to the Italian law firm Portolano Cavallo, where I mainly focus on data protection and technology um, matters. Uh, and I've been working on data protection for many years because when I was a student, I took a degree on uh, the first Italian data protection law. And since then, I've never abandoned <laughs> this. <laughs> I'm, and I'm, of course, I mean, things have changed in the years. But, uh, but it's been really interesting and we and, and I work on, on many, uh, you know, all the, all the different aspects uh, concerning data um, and, uh, and technology in, in our firm. And I'm basically, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I know you are also members of different associations like Italian Privacy Institution Scientific Committee, uh, International Association of Privacy Professionals, yeah. right? Um, yeah. You're very active in this area. Yes, and I'm also very happy to share that uh, I am uh, the vice president of an Italian association, uh, uh, which is Women and Technology. So I'm today I'm very happy to 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 be here, also in representation of uh, of I mean uh, of, of my role in this uh, in this association. And also um, I'm 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 also a member of ITEC Law Association, an association of technology lawyers. I'm actually a member of the executive committee, and I must say I'm here attending a conference in the US where we think the technology lawyers of like ITECLO are meeting uh, you know today this is my last day of the conference so yes thank you thank you Lara welcome again so Vera can I can I ask you to introduce yourself yeah certainly and also thank you for inviting me uh, Celine uh, my name is Vera Jungkind I'm a partner in uh, at Hengeler Müller in Germany, which is a, a German law firm, a full service firm. Uh, I'm a partner in the regulatory and public law department. So I deal with all sorts of product compliance measures, data protection, and also further regulatory um, measures. We have uh, worked on the AI Act, which is upcoming in Europe and which we will discuss uh, today in the GDPR. Um, so a lot of data driven, but also product compliance related um, issues. Thank you. Thank you very welcome again. And Elif, uh, our dear Elif from Turkey, can you please introduce yourself? Of course. And uh, I also would like to thank for this uh, invitation. It's a real pleasure for me to be here with uh, all of you. And as uh, you mentioned before, I'm an associate professor at Bahçeşehir University of Law uh, in Istanbul. I'm also the head of the general public law 
uh, department at the same university. Uh, I have been researching, uh, writing and speaking on uh, legal problems related to the new information technologies uh, for almost a long time, I may say, um, since the beginning of 2000s. And uh, I'm uh, also lecturing on this subject. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing. Yes. I think you, you and you and Laura, Laura have something in common. You were the first ones uh, to work on the first uh, the protection laws in your own countries. Elif has, uh, has published three books, actually. One of them is the protection law, which is a very, very good for, for all practitioners. But we will focus on her third book today a little bit, which talks about uh, AI, uh, AI and uh, it's called Digital Elephant. Um, uh, it's a very interesting book and uh, we'll, we'll have a little bit of uh, discussions on that topic as well. So Laura, uh, I know you have to go because you have other engagements and um, that's why uh, before further ado, I, I would like to ask you the biggest question today because AI seems to be very complicated and so uh, frightening to, to many of us. And we sometimes, I guess, uh, try to avoid it and think it's too complicated and it's not for us, but actually it is. And we have to understand what it is because sometimes we think about autonomous cars, sometimes we think about algorithms, but we really need to know whether it's a, a, AI systems are superheroes or villains. What do you think? <laughs> Well, I, I think that, uh, uh, first of all, I mean, maybe I can, I, I will start uh, by saying uh, that we, we don't, uh, you know, a, a, a common definition of AI, um, at least not for now, because you were, as you were saying, Celine, uh, things are going to change with probably, with, at least we will have a legal <laughs> definition. AI in the AI um, Act when uh, AI regulation that is under discussion currently uh, in Europe. And it's interesting because, you know, the definition that is provided in the AI regulation is that uh, AI is any software that uh, um, using certain techniques that are listed in the, in the, in the regulation um, are able to generate outputs um, for a given set of uh, defin defined objectives and you know, uh, such as content, predictions, recommendations, decisions, influencing the environment that they interact with. So it's a very broad definition, I would say, uh, of AI um, in, the, in the regulation. We'll see what, what this, uh, I mean, is going to mean then when it is going to be enacted and it's going to be enforced. And I think the, the interesting thing with the AI regulation that is just a proposal for now, it's under discussion in the EU. Uh, to me, at least, uh, I, would, I would like to stress the fact that, um, you know, this regulation comes after uh, uh, the, the approval and the, the, the publication of a, a white paper one year before. So, uh, of course, as you probably all know, uh, EU institutions are working hard on, you know, trying to, um, you know, uh, create, a, 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 you know, a common ground of uh, legislation on data and AI in Europe. And they, and they, and they do this mainly uh, uh, addressing two main things in the, in the AI regulation. They want to, um, you know, they start from the, uh, 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 you know, um, as, you know, they start saying that there are risks connected with AI. So to some extent, you know, you're right. That is something that, uh, you know, there's a creepy aspect around mm -hmm. intelligence. And I think that this, because, you know, there might be several risks according to the EU institutions, which goes from, you know, uh, opaque decision-making. Mm -hmm. Of course, citizens are not able to understand what's behind the, the, the software that is taking this decision and is you know uh, providing that, that output or gender-based uh, discrimination or ba discrimination based on other criteria which might be opaque as well because we don't know um, or even intrusion in you know citizens lives without them knowing so the, the main objective of the regulation is addressing these aspects and, and the way AI can affect both the material sphere of a life of a person, 
and the immaterial sphere of the life of a person. And, you know, because consequences can, can be um, uh, affecting, uh, you, know, the, 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 you know, the relationship or, uh, you know, the status of a person, but also their physical life, I mean, their, their lives. If you think at uh, a, a connected device, for example, using artificial intelligence in the health sector, of course, it's important also to grant you know, security and safety of individuals. So I think the interesting thing with this regulation is that it's moving on two different parallel, I would say, and, and you know, uh, in, in intersected uh, aspects. One is uh, uh, compliance as a, very similarly, I think with the GDPR, compliance in the process, you know, in the, in the process of developing and designing AI systems. Um, and compliance as a product, because of course, a, a, an AI system must be also considered as a product, can affect the, the, the physical life of a person. So it is important to, to also to work on the product compliance aspects. And I think the AI regulation is trying to make an effort to, to, to combine you know, to these two aspects. And the other important objective, I think, is that the, the, you know, with this regulation, uh, of course, what the institutions in Europe have in mind is create a trustworthy environment for the development of this technology and also, uh, you know, ensure a kind of a legal certainty. Well, a legal certainty. I say a kind of because then I see sometimes that, you know, the objective is to create legal certainty. But then in practice, um, this is, might be very hard, and I will tell later why I, I, I say so, based on my experience on data protection uh, legislation. And I think there is also an intersection, of course, between data protection legislation and a, this AI regulation where it will come into, because of course the two things are connected. And I'm, I'm always thinking, happy to think that we, uh, as the people and lawyers dealing with data protection, are quite lucky because we have been able to work on uh, issues connected to AI, maybe among the first, you know, uh, lawyers and people because, people because it's, uh, because actually waiting for the AI regulation to come into force in Europe, we Europeans have the GDPR, which is at least partially devoting, devoted, a part of the GDPR is devoted to, to um, you know, to, uh, regulate these systems, and I'm referring in particular, uh, of course, to Article 22 sure. of the GDPR, which basically states uh, that every everyone has the right not to be subject to automated decisions, uh, entirely automated decisions, which might affect their life and they are, you know, or have a legal effect um, on, on on them. So, and I and I and I think um, at in, in particular in Italy, there have been a, a number of cases concerning Article 22, yes. which are interesting because it's the first, you know, the first developments on algorithms and AI, uh, even though focused on data protection, uh, data protection aspects rather than, you know, a global comprehensive uh, legislation on AI, which we, we don't have for the time being. So, uh, so yes. yes, and, yes. Uh, yeah. So I actually, I mean, algorithms, when we talk about AI, uh, algorithms are maybe one of the main uh, problems at the moment that the courts and the authorities are attacking or reviewing. Uh, and uh, we shouldn't be only focusing on robots and things like, you know, more complicated issues when it comes to AI, but simply algorithms that are used in uh, many softwares or many processes can be subject to uh, complaints, as we saw in many cases so far, uh, and can can actually trigger uh, 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 individuals' right to uh, in, uh, inform or um, um, other rights like deletion and so on, right? Yes, and and uh, 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 by the way, I I would like to mention maybe an interesting case, a recent, very recent case. It was just maybe one or two months ago, where, because the interesting thing is that in Italy, these this matters, these subjects have been, um, you know, uh, uh, object of decisions, not only by the data protection authorities, but also by 
um, um, the Supreme Administrative Courts or even regional administrative courts and also by civil, the Civil Court of Cassation, which is the Supreme High Court of, uh, in Italy, um, Civil Court in Italy. And, uh, and one of the recent cases, uh, because you mentioned algorithms and AI, one of the recent cases uh, uh, from a, the Supreme Administrative Court has been um, focusing on the difference, according to them, between algorithms and artificial intelligence. Because, and this was because there was a, you know, a public procurement pitch a bit uh, for um, for a medical device where a company was preferred um, instead of another, and of course the other one was was challenging the, the decision of the public administration, and it was all around whether the medical device could be considered a, um, a, a embedding artificial mm. intelligence or not. And basically, in that case, um, the the Supreme Court. Um, made a distinction, which was not actually something new. This, this distinction was made also by lower courts, administrative courts in previous cases. And basically what they say is that an algorithm is a simple, simple <laughs> defined set of instructions, uh, which can be automatically, automatically executed, executed and bring to a determined result. For example, solve a problem, make a calculation, or even assess, uh, treat or treat a disease. Um, while artificial intelligence, according to the judges, uh, um, makes reference to the notion of, of an intelligent agent, um, when a system, so a system that can perceive the environment or what other people do around uh, the system and interact with the environment and people. And so um, uh, learn from experience, for example, machine learning systems and uh, can elaborate a, a natural language, for example. So they, they make a distinction be between algorithm and inter artificial intelligence. Of course, not for data protection purposes or yeah. for purposes. This is just because there was a public procurement bid. But it's interesting to see that they consider these two things different. And honestly, I question to myself whether these under the AI regulation, this distinction really makes sense or not. Uh, I don't have a, a real it's answer. It's a million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, but it's interesting to see where uh, they are going, you know. Uh, although, I mean, one could be could agree or disagree with what they're saying, of course. That's that's it. And and the other, I, I could also mention other uh, interesting cases. Yes, from, please. From um, administrative courts, because uh, there has been a turning, uh, a, a change of position in the in the years. Back in 2019, for example, there have been a number of cases in which administrative courts basically stated that public administration could not um, use uh, algorithms to, um, you know, to perform their institutional activities. There has been an interesting case in, in Italy uh, at the time where a number of civil, um, you know, workers, uh, in, in, in particular teachers, they were assigned to different, you know, schools in Italy based, just based on an algorithm. And the results of this algorithm were like, you know, the People from Sicily were moved to Milan or or Trento, so it was really and it, and it was on the on the newspapers and many uh, people um, actually challenged the decision and uh, and uh, and so uh, in some cases the administrative court stated that uh, the software basically the general principle is, is that a software an algorithm cannot substitute. Um, a public administration, human decision, because this would be contrary, according to this decision, to the principles of impartiality, effectiveness, and transparency, uh, which must inspire the public, uh, you know, actions. But then this was overturned by other decisions, following decisions, where in, instead the, the Supreme um, Administrative Court uh, Court says, basically stated that algorithms are beneficial to serial and standardized procedures, so the contrary. <laughs> and um, of course, using algorithms in the, in the public administration means in any way that algorithms must, must comply with general principles of transparency, effectiveness, proportionality, impartiality, uh, um, non-discrimination that of course regulate 
the, the, the action of public administration. Uh, but it's interesting to say that there was this completely, uh, you know, the position really shifted to the, to the contrary. And, um, and, uh, uh, and of course, and, and they also stated that whenever a, a, the public administration makes use of an algorithm in when, is, when working, I mean, when, you know, providing their, their, their performing their activities, uh, basically there is, there is no possibility to um, oppose confidentially, confidential, uh, you know, obligations uh, uh, and any person has the right to access, uh, you know, um, uh, and understand the logic of the, of, the, of the software and of the algorithm, because of course this is a general principles under Italian administrative law. And none of these decisions, quite interesting, interestingly, made reference or made a connection with uh, the existing legislation on, I mean, data protection legislation. Yeah. Transparency is not only a, a principle uh, for public administration, uh, general principles, but it's also, a, a, you know, one of the main, uh, you know, uh, principles and one of the main requirements under yeah. uh, are. And this is become this is becoming to um, happen really recently. I mean, just recently, some decisions of the administrative courts are also making re reference to Article Twenty Two, and so basically they say, you know, there must be a requirement of transparency. There, there is another interesting issue, and that is whether a public administration can rely on consent or not, no. because okay. we have a pre yeah, we have a principle in Italy, which um, uh, in the law implementing the GPR, which says that uh, public administration cannot rely on consent the subject because of the, of course, the, the unbalance or, I mean, this is the principle and they have to rely on um, law or uh, the public interest. So, uh, and another interesting thing is that the public interest um, up until last year, the public interest had to be established by law, while now there has been an amendment and the public After interest... After COVID, I guess. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, you're right. It was a consequence, actually, of the difficulties that many public administrations were having getting data uh, on, you know, during the pandemic and also in, you know, uh, purposes. Um, so they changed this and the public interest can be assessed by any single public administration by themselves. Uh, so this is quite, uh, you know, this is an, uh, the extreme opposite as it was before. Before we need a law, we needed a law, which might be difficult because, you know, all the laws didn't make any reference yeah. to protection, but now any public administration can decide. And so in the end, they, they, they would probably rely on one of these two legal bases also for, for algorithms. Uh, yes. And um, yeah. And, and also, I, I think there was an interesting, um, an interesting decision by the Court of Cassation recently, um, years ago, um, which actually, this is also interesting because it was before the GDPR came into force uh, and it concerned a social scoring platform Mm, this is scary. <laughs> That's the real part. <laughs> yeah, and also it's it's one of social scoring is one of the things that you know, according to the, I mean, the AI are, are considered as you know, you know, the high providing presenting higher risks uh, together together with facial recognition systems. And by the way, in Italy we have a ban on facial recognition systems mm. in spaces and in uh, spaces open to the public. What, what the Italian uh, legislator has decided is that to anticipate what was a plan, uh, you know, uh, in, in Europe to ban this type of um, facial recognition systems. And actually Italy has implemented a law last year, clearly stating that this is not allowed. Mm. One exception, which to me, it's also the most scary. <laughs> the exception is uh, um, that uh, this can be done for the prosecution of crimes and, you know, and uh, uh, by competent authorities. So a vague concept of competent authorities or even by authorities in general, public authorities in general. But in this case, they have to seek 
a prior approval by the Italian Data Protection Authority. Mm. That's, uh, that's uh, also interesting. And uh, well, going back to social scoring algorithms, in that case, a company wanted to implement a social scoring platform, uh, meaning that they were either uh, collecting data from people adhering to the platform, you know, consciously part of the platform um, and collecting data from, from them um, data which could be uh, public data, but also data provided, you know, by the by the parties, by the by the, by the persons on the platform, uh, concerning their economic status, their employment, stuff like that. And also, the platform also was also planning to collect profiles of other people not adhering to the platform, but that they were based on data that were publicly available on the on the web, right? And this was blocked by the Garante before the GDPR came, in. came into force. Um, they said, well, you, you can't do this. So, uh, the, the, uh, you know, at that time, it was not a limitation order. It was a block order. <laughs> um, and, uh, and they filed an appeal. And, uh, and actually, the civil court uh, uh, canceled the decision of the Garante. Um, and... Uh, and the guarantee, of course, filed an appeal <laughs> before the Court of Cassation, and the Court of Cassation repealed uh, the, the, the decision cancelling the order because they said, basically, the order you did, basically, the the the, the, the civil court decision was um, saying that um, those who adhere to the platform. Uh, they were conscious of the fact that there was this social scoring, mm. scoring so they were consciously and they, they were willing to uh, be subject to these social scoring systems. Um, while the court of cassation stated, you know, even those adhering, they, they're, they're, when they adhere and they accept to do the terms and conditions, doesn't mean that they know that what, what is going to happen with the scoring because there was no clarity on yes. the criteria used to give a score to each single person. We go back to transparency again. <laughs> That's the core. So uh, before before you go, Laura, because I know you have to attend um, uh, other meetings today. It's early in the morning in San Francisco. Um, maybe Vera, would you like to um, add something to the current cases uh, before uh, Laura uh, leaves? And your experience in, <laughs> in Germany? <laughs> Absolutely, I think we we have already quite a quite an interesting number of, of case law in in Europe. Uh, even though the AI Act, so the dedicated regulation of AI, is not yet enforced. Yeah, so at the moment the authorities apply data protection laws or also labor laws and 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 related legislation. Um, just re just just uh, recently, um, we saw, for example, a case from the from the Hungarian Data Protection Authority, which dealt with a, a very uh, down-to-earth uh, situation, namely uh, the automated analysis of customer calls in a, in a customer service center. So the, um, the company recorded incoming customer calls and then overnight analyzed the state of mind, the emotional state of a caller in order to, to identify those customers that were upset and, and needed a call from, from, from customer service, which is actually quite a good idea, yeah, to, 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 to keep these people um, as a customer and to, to, to calm them and also to address their needs. So it was certainly, I think uh, the intention was certainly a, a good one, yeah, one that was supposed to, to foster the business. However, um, this is quite quite an intrusive form of, of data uh, data processing because uh, you analyze uh, the, the state of mind. So really, also an, an inner uh, an inner uh, emotions of, of of a person. Yeah, and this is also the, the new or the proposed uh, AI act uh, treats that as a as a as a particular form of data processing to, to, to look at yeah, and to watch out for. Um, and there, in this case, uh, and coming back to, to Laura's point on, on transparency, so the, the, the supervisory authority criticized that this entire process of, of, of 
analyzing the state of mind of callers was not at all transparent, so which meant that people using this hotline were not aware um, that that their, their 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 voice their call would be analyzed, and that was uh, important to to the authorities. So they uh, so they issued a, a what we call a stop processing order. Yeah, so they ordered the the company to to stop that kind of processing and to to bring it into compliance um, with with GDPR, basically, which meant that. The company would have to do a, a data protection impact assessment, yeah, and also um, assess the risks and 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 uh, perform measures to to reduce that risk, and importantly, also inform people uh, about uh, about this. The the data protection authority also took issue that the voice recordings were kept for quite a long time, and also the the, the results of the analysis. So so a number of other concerns about that data processing. But I think what is important here is that uh, analyzing the emotional state of mind by, by, by a machine yeah, with, with automated tools that is seen as, as intrusive. Yeah, so it, it, yeah, it, it concerns, it, it, it impacts the rights and freedoms of the individual. So it should not take place without these safeguards without the data protection impact assessment, without the required transparency. Um, yeah, and, and, and that, that case or that reasoning could be, could be transferred to, to a lot of uh, other cases that, that we see. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, uh, Lara, um, yes, please. No, I would just add before I go, I just wanted to add very quickly, Celine, and then I leave you. <laughs> and uh, although I, I'm very sorry because I would like to stay with you uh, longer. I, I just wanted to mention two different things that the Garante made recently. One is a decision against uh, uh, food delivery companies, uh, two food delivery companies that were sanctioned. And one of the main uh, uh, issues for which they were sanctioned is it uh, their algorithm assigning orders to riders. So not a consumer, uh, law related, you know, uh, issue, but rather concerning riders, and uh, and basically in that case, one of the issues that were, they were challenged to, uh, in connection to these two decisions is that the the um, a part of the, the 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 transparency, of course, and so whether this was it was not transparent to riders, but also fact that these this, um, uh, algorithms uh, assigning orders could be discriminatory against riders. And so in the, in the opinion of the guarantee, there were no sufficient measures to assess and evaluate the results of the algorithm. And also, um, you know, measures to allow riders to request human intervention. Mm -hmm. On this point, I would like only to raise one question that I had is that, you know how an assignment order uh, algorithm can work. It, it process basically like thousands and thousands of orders at the same time. So my question is, how can the rider raise the issue of human intervention in relation to this algorithm, which is like in seconds in, you know, does everything? Because of course they cannot raise their hand and say, well, I want to know why you're assigning this order to me uh, instead of another order that you're giving to the to another rider, and this is an interesting thing. And the other thing is a, a recent case um, concerning a public a private university in Italy where they implemented a proctoring system to con to check whether online exams were carried out properly by the students <laughs> by using. <laughs> we have that in Turkey too. <laughs> using biometric data and these in this case the interesting thing is of course this according to the guarantee was profiling and so automated decision although the final decision on whether the, the, the exam was carried out regularly or not was, was taken by the teacher but still the profiling was uh, you know so it was um, there was a profiling not article 22 but a profile and uh, and um, and in this case the interesting thing is that uh, the, the system was not able to identify the person. So, you know, the, 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 the grant said, well, yes, but it's biometric data anyway, because the system can uh, understand whether the person starting the exam is the same person and, the, uh, you know, for the whole exam. 
in the exam. So this is still, even if it's not able to identify the person because the identification was a separate system, um, in any event, the fact that the system is able to recognize that is, there is always the same person behind the screen for the whole exam means that this is biometric data. So this is also, I think, an interesting very point. Very interesting, yes, very interesting. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, I think the lessons learned from uh, our yes. first discussions is that, yes, transparency is the key, as always. There are principles and in the current legal systems already in place for us to protect our rights uh, and we need to just enforce them without even waiting for new laws, new regulations, because the, the principles are there and those yeah. key principles apply whatever uh, the new technology is. That's, yeah. That will be my conclusion from our yeah. first discussions, yes. I think from the, from the side, uh, to me, from, uh, you know, shifting from the person perspective, which I think it's really important because I am a citizen as well, and I have want my be, to be protected. I would say on the side of the of the business, yeah, I think the the lessons learned are do not underestimate the existing laws and also um, work on a dynamic concept of compliance, which means that there must be policies in place rather than checklist or documentation. This is important, but it's not the essence. Yeah. Uh, have policies and also practices within the companies to assess, you know, uh, and to work on the design of the systems with all the stakeholders involved in a company and also on monitoring whether the system and how the system is working and what are the results of the system constantly. Compliance is an ongoing process and yes. bear this in mind. Um, so Thank that's you. My... Thank you, Lara. So have a lovely day. Um, for those who, who, who want to uh, follow Lara, they can always follow her on her, on her LinkedIn uh, profile. Um, yes. And... Or if you have as well, um, please contact me on LinkedIn if, LinkedIn if we want, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely day. So, um, I think we've been discussing quite uh, uh, deeply the uh, practice and what's happening in Europe in terms of regulatory developments and court cases, but I still have uh, not a clear answer on my question uh, after even discussing the uh, cases about what is AI. Um, I Maybe Elif, you can uh, give a nice uh, definition for me, a, a simple one. Uh, for all those uh, are listening today. Okay, of course. Um, um, first, I, I, I think I need to say that there is no single agreed open definition of artificial intelligence. And if we check the discussions related to the artificial intelligence, I think um, sometimes um, the topic is not the same technology. So um, without getting uh, into the terminological debates, uh, maybe I can make a, di a distinction between um, the meanings of artificial intelligence. And with this distinction, I'm going to follow academic scoops, Hildebrand and Jacques Schiffel. And in my understanding, actually, I think we can define uh, three different concepts, robots, artificial intelligence, and artificial general intelligence. And uh, robot refers to automatic agents, uh, physically in motion, and automatically performing one or more predator mind actions. Artificial intelligence, and we may call it as narrow or weak AI, refers to autonomic agents that can modify their program to better achieve specific goals. And there is also an artificial general intelligence, we may call it as general or strong AI, and it refers to autonomous agents um, capable of setting their own targets and uh, creating rules and principles um, to guide their interactions. Like mimicking and humans, I guess. Actually, I may say that in some kind of this 
dystopian uh, literature or dystopian movies and talks, uh, people generally refer something like artificial general inter intelligence, not always, but I mean, general. And I think the distinction uh, is very important uh, related to our discussion topics, uh, because the robots, we may call it as automatic agents, uh, movements can be predicted. So we can predict what the robot is going to do. On contrary, in some cases, it is not possible to completely predict the actions of artificial intelligence. Mm. But with this, I mean narrow artificial intelligence. But this does not mean that they can, I mean, uh, narrow artificial intelligence can set their objectives and they definitely do not have consciousness, mm. for instance, because there are lots of uh, discussions also related to the uh, cons consciousness and machines. Uh, I do not want to deep these deep uh, uh, <laughs> theoretical discussions, uh, but um, this sort of artificial intelligence uh, is something that actually we are familiar in our daily lives. They for can example, be. Can you give oh, an example for us? Oh, of course, uh, lots of translation and navigation devices uh, use artificial intelligence, uh, which collects a uh, huge amounts of data. And then um, in so many cases with machine learning systems, uh, they uh, give the outputs to us. Uh, I would like to mention also what is uh, this third one, I mean, a general or powerful artificial intelligence. Uh, it is quite different from this uh, kind of um, sophisticated, even sophisticated artificial intelligence technologies because a general artificial intelligence uh, can achieve an infinite number of objectives and even create uh, separate objectives in unknown conditions. And this is a type we see most frequently in popular culture. Mm. And there are, uh, although there are examples of artificial intelligence that can perform particular tasks better than humans, although we see lots of different, very, very interesting examples of narrow artificial intelligence, an artificial general intelligence that can perform all tasks as well as or better or even better than humans have not been developed yet. So artificial, in, artificial general intelligence is more a discussion topic for today. Yeah. And when I read especially um, some discussions on social media or in some uh, papers, uh, I don't mean the academic papers, but in some papers, I think that uh, some people have some kind of confusion between these different kinds. So, uh, but it doesn't mean that I do not give any importance to the potential uh, of uh, artificial general intelligence, because I think even this potential makes us question uh, fundamentals of today's world and i don't know i will cut at this point maybe <laughs> yes, we can maybe, talk about yes. it yes maybe vera <laughs> i mean i'm not going to ask you the same question because we have uh, <laughs> thank you thank you elif you had a very detailed explanation of it but i my question to you is what are in your opinion what are the impacts of ai the, the way that elif described us in different aspects of it on on us as as humans and and again, what what could what could be what what are the principles that we should evaluate in in regulating uh, or in uh, in uh, defining uh, the AI? Because we talked about some of the principles, but it, I think it is key here to really um, grab the uh, importance of the matter for for us as humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, the 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 what you said, Elif, is what is from a from a from a scientific perspective. What is AI? Yeah, and then the the second question is um, how is AI regulated, and would it capture the same the same forms of AI? Then would it make distinctions between uh, 
forms of AI in terms of how deep the regulation um, would would concern different, how deeply it would go into the different forms of AI. What is the the impact? I think that the impact can be very different. Yeah, so it um, it it's really important to to look at the individual features of of each technology. Yeah, so you cannot say AI is generally intrusive or generally bad or has a, has a has this and that impact i think it's really a, a case by case analysis this is also why um sometimes the the general discussion is, is is too broad yeah and but what can i think there is a potential that ai impacts various uh various human rights yeah so it's uh, and it's not just about data or a uh, privacy yeah but it can really have an impact on 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 human rights more generally yeah for example um and laura touched upon it uh, slightly already um there is an issue of equality or uh, or non discrimination yeah so um if if the ai involves uh, decision making or prepares decision making by not using a, a, a correct data set or by not using a, a fair way of, of, of making that decision yeah there is a risk of of bias of uh, of, of non -dis of discrimination which which can be for different criteria yeah it can be gender based it can be um, uh, can relate to racial um, racial discrimination or discrimination due to age or, or, or other forms of discrimination yeah so that is quite a quite a quite a risk or quite an impact that that AI can have and and, and in in a, in a risk and compliance assessment um, which needs to be reviewed um, then another uh, I think important risk is also um, but does is there a right to or is the right to 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 dignity yeah and and um non um exclusion from from society or the like uh, is that respected it can also have the same impact as as discrimination but there is i think an additional um aspect to is, is there a sy systematic um decision making against certain parts uh, of society or certain groups of, of of people yeah so that is a risk there can be uh, citizen rights yeah so for example the the right to vote or the right to to free speech and free press is that something that that can be affected um uh, and also others uh, other rights on the other hand yeah restricting and and this is also i think what we need to 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 keep in mind restricting ai technology too much can also uh, impact human rights yeah because there is a right to of course to, to to conduct your business to to free free scientific um research and 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 development um also there is a societal interest in 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 in, in benefiting from from new technological um, developments and, and the improvements made by this technology. Yeah, so um, I think a, a good regulation would try to to bring these um, these different aspects into into in, into an uh, or would balance these. Interests. Balance. Yeah. Also, of course, different human rights or different uh, interests of of individuals can can collide. Yeah, so. Um, a right to privacy, for example, may um, may uh, may uh, conflict with the right to to public to health and to public health. Yeah, so um, I think it is important uh, that that a good regulation also um, has a balanced approach towards towards um, balancing uh, different human rights. Do you, uh, at the end, I mean, obviously, we are talking from um, an European approach to things. Um, uh, when we are in Europe, the, the data protection has uh, humans in the center, human rights in the center of it, and uh, the human dignity and, and protect, protection of human rights. Obviously, in, in US, the, the, 
the, the approach is maybe different, but from a European uh, approach, yes, this is actually um, a, a very basic uh, problem when dealing with AI, because we really need to make a balance between different rights, different uh, human rights, and then put humans in center. Uh, but it's not an easy job, obviously. I mean, uh, saying it's uh, easy, but uh, uh, implementing it in, in real life, maybe it's really hard. Uh, that's why there are impact assessments in place uh, and from the development till the deployment of the, uh, of the processes. Uh, but it is a very uh, difficult task for everybody, uh, I assume. Um, um, Elif, would you, would you like to add anything on, on our discussions? As, as a public law um, uh, academic? Actually, I um, agree with Vera, of course, uh, these, um, I think in the core of the problems, or uh, maybe I, don't, I, I should not refer it as a problem, but maybe in the core, there is human dignity. And that's why we need to uh, interpret and we need to think on the, outcomes of artificial intelligence from this perspective, from the human rights perspective. Um, but besides this, actually, I may say that I think um, all the new inform information technologies has um, a holistic uh, transformative effects uh, of this kind of basic uh, concepts. And um, I don't know if we have time, I would like to um, explain this point uh, briefly. Yes, please. Yeah, okay. When you said holistic, you already grabbed our attention. Please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I'm going to uh, speak more philosophically. Maybe uh, I, I hope that I uh, I still can have you in this discussion. <laughs> okay. Um, I think, or not I think, actually, it's a fact. Um, human beings, uh, without a doubt, are the ones who dream, thought, and construct states. And uh, since the age of enlightenment, there has been an intellectual progress that has put people at the core of the political system. And I think we thought like this. Human beings are the only beings who can use their minds to make rational decisions. And for instance, uh, if you think about um, Immanuel Kant's uh, philosophy, then we can also find this um, value, value of human beings related to this kind of capacities. And based on this assumption and with the constitutional movements and the modern understanding of citizenship, uh, individuals have become the sole decision-making unit of the political system. And even today uh, in authoritarian or, to, or even totalitarian systems, those in power aim to demonstrate popular support, support by even sometimes deceiving the public. Uh, I mean that you must be elected or said or elected to reign. And similarly, modern law also follows a logic that is founded uh, on the responsible, uh, responsible individual. Only human reason can determine between right and wrong, between lawful and unlawful, uh, and hence only humans can be sanctioned. That's why when we think about the trials of rats, horses, or grasshoppers in the Middle Ages, uh, it looks like most probably as a a bizarre comedy to us. And at this point, the advancements in AI technologies, I think, pose uh, some unexpected questions. And these questions are they, high risk. Will they disrupt the whole system that we're living in? <laughs> yeah, I think even this question is um, uh, very strong, I mean, or very frightening, I may say. Can non human beings make rational decisions? Because if there is a possibility to answer this question affirmatively, there will be a need to reconsider uh, our uh, distinguishing characteristics as human beings. And we um, generally, with we, of course, I do not mean I, uh, you, uh, and uh, our audiences, but as a human beings, as a big uh, family of humanity, I don't know how can I call this, 
uh, we generally think that we are superior to other beings because we have a rational thinking. And please do not understand me wrongly. I don't say that this is the good way to think. And this, I, do, I definitely do not say that this is a, a good way to have uh, to construct our relationships with our ecosystem, I mean, the earth and the other beings. But we think like this, we are different because we are making these discussions. We are meeting on a webinar, we construct this internet infrastructure. And uh, I'm in Istanbul, uh, you are in London, I think Vera is in Germany now. And uh, we can make these discussions and we can talk about the human dignity, the developments in artificial intelligence and so on. So we have this capacity and we are the only beings that have this capacity and we are the only beings who makes make uh, rational decisions at least it's still true by the way so I, it, I mean the question is we were were we the ones and we will will we be the ones to do those decisions now with those developments in artificial intelligence i think that is where you're coming to <laughs> yes definitely of course we are still the only ones who are doing this as far as we know i don't know uh of course but uh, on the earth, I may say, we may say, I think we are the only ones. But uh, as you mentioned that we don't know what is going to be in the future. And I think that from my perspective, even this question is important. And uh, even seeing this possibility uh, is important because uh, when, we, uh, when we think about the uh, rational, philosophical, and theoretical foundations of the modern law and the modern state, we um, sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly, we find this capacity, we find references uh, to this capacity. That's why I uh, think um, these questions, um, ra uh, the, 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 um, uh, the questions raised by uh, AI, uh, technologies and developments related to this are very important, I think. Yes, um, Vera, I mean, um, what do you think about um, um, this approach? Uh, obviously, I mean, at the moment, yes, we have to think about uh, many um, uh, the principles in terms of accountability, in terms of transparency, in terms of, you know, uh, going through all the impact assessments and so on. So there is uh, there is this process that we need to work on, but at the end there will be accountability issue, and who's going to be responsible for what is uh, what uh, uh, um, as a result of the uh, automated processes? So that will be the question that we will need to answer eventually. And if we want to enforce our rights as individuals under GDPR or under other data protection uh, legislation, um, we will need to find the one who's responsible. So when it when the question is, okay, who's the responsible one? And when you are the one that who's responsible, how do you um, uh, defend yourself in terms of the processes and in terms of what you have done and on on your um, thought uh, processes as well? Mm -hmm. Who's responsible? Yes, in I think in a in a first place, uh, society is responsible for the way it proposes to use AI. And this means that in, 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 in regulations, um, you, as a society, as a legislator, you need to make certain decisions about what, what, what you want and what you don't want. And in the, in the draft AI Act of the EU, for example, there is a very clear proposed decision. It's just a draft, but the decision that is proposed is that certain uh, very high risk AI systems are prohibited as such. Yeah, so that is a decision that that uh, the legislator proposes to make for, for, for society that um, we, we, we see that there are certain unacceptable forms of, of AI that we, we, we would like to exclude upfront. Yeah, so um, and, and, and that is then uh, defined. And I think it, it very much matches the the approach of of this human centric approach yeah, which says that in uh, where 
where people are um, excluded, certain groups of people are excluded from society where there is an unacceptable um, discrimination or where people are, uh, where, where, where AI exploits the vulner vulnerability of people or, or sort of misuses their, their, their weaknesses or their inabilities. That is something that we uh, would not like as a, to see as a society, so we exclude that. Um, I think that is, um, this is how, how, how the legislator responsibly um, regulates AI. And then uh, I think a certain, a second step is that there is this principle of ultimate human oversight. So um, any, so, so AI technology that is acceptable generally um, has to, to, to comply with certain rules and ultimately there needs to be human oversight. So it cannot sort of like the, like the, 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 the apprentice of the, of the wizard, yeah, by, by, of, of Goethe, it cannot become independent. Yeah, so it mm. cannot control humans, but humans continue to control the technology. Whether that will work in practice, we will see. Yeah, but I think that is the idea of the regulation. And, and, and I think that's, that's comforting. So which, because it also means that the developer of AI and the user of AI cannot, uh, cannot, uh, renounce to, to, to continuing to, to, to take that responsibility for the AI that, that he has developed. Yeah? So there, there needs to be this human oversight. Having said that, I think it's also important, this idea that sometimes the AI-based decision may be better than a, a human decision because it's perhaps less biased, less uh, arbitrary. Um, does not mean that there is no human oversight over this decision. Yeah, so you can have both. You can have a process that solely relies on, on, on AI if it remains controlled by a human being. So you can have the benefit of, of this, let's say, perfect machine taken decision um, uh, while still having this, this human oversight over it. So uh, I mean the uh, the AI Act is um, is a very uh, strong legislation, and it's maybe at the moment as as we saw in GDPR, is um, e EU is kind of a, a pioneer in this area. Um, it's very strong in regulating or coming up with um, uh, regulations that can affect the world, not only Europe but in uh, the whole world. We we saw that in GDPR. With GDPR uh, coming into effect, the whole uh, data protection and privacy matters all over the world had a different uh, direction. And do you think uh, this new approach or this um, uh, regulatory uh, um, approach from EU will have a similar effect uh, all over the world in terms of accepting it as a principle, as a general framework? And following it as uh, as a good ex um, example um, by other countries or jurisdictions. Well, I, I think there is it's a it's, it's an ambitious draft. It's an ambitious approach. We will see whether this will become law because while it is while it has this ambition of of, of fully regulating AI. It is also being criticized for being for, for placing too strong obligations on, on developers and, and users of, of AI. So we will see whether this draft will not be um, adjusted and amended in, in the process to, to have perhaps a more balanced approach uh, towards or perhaps a bit more liberal, liberal approach to also allow more forms of AI to be classified as, as just regular AI, um, the, the definition of, of high risk AI, which is then regulated under the act is, is quite wide. Yeah, so, so also very simple forms of AI may, may fall under, under heavy regulation. And that's perhaps a bit um, too, 
too much, yeah, or, or yeah. The, there is an there is a, an abstract risk assessment uh, in the in the draft act that that also includes, yeah, if I may, regular or, or, or low risk AI into this definition of of, of high risk. Um, but apart from from that, so there there may be some adjustments once an AI act comes into force in Europe, I, I do think, and, and that certainly is the ambition of the European Commission, that it will impact uh, other, other parts of the world, um, as, for example, the GDPR, or also the, the, the dual use, uh, uh, so the export control laws, for example, on, and other, other areas of the law have influenced other parts of the world. But sometimes um, this effect is also that that then the, the 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 other jurisdictions adapt this act, so they take it as perhaps as an example, but uh, but they adapt it also, and 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 sometimes then they also go back uh, on on certain very strict requirements mm -hmm. and 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 adapt them to the to the needs of their uh, jurisdiction. Um, I also think that that the, the the EU looks looks abroad and 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 sees uh, what is the, the the approach to regulation in in other countries in the US in China for example um, to also um, check whether whether its its draft still is still is appropriate because what you of course need to see and it's also a question of, of remaining competitive. Yeah, you can have a very a high standard in Europe, human rights, control, human oversight and all that. But what is an, an, what is an express uh, target of this regulation is also to, to, to encourage industry and, and, and companies to, to develop and promote and, and sell AI abroad. And if the, the, the restrictions are, too too heavy on on the companies. They they this might may have the the opposing effect. Uh, and um, and so so I think um, the the European Commission will also constantly review its own approach. So I think at the end of the day, even if there are no regulations, um, it is up to us who are maybe individuals or who are developers of of these new technologies. Um, to always keep in mind this concept of responsible AI. This is, uh, this is something uh, essential in my understanding uh, going forward, because we, I mean, we don't know what the future will bring us in, in terms of new technologies or uh, in, intrusive methods. But at the end of the day, if we can hold on to, the, to this concept of responsible AI and have the principles, procedures, and, and guide, uh, follow certain guidelines in developing or deployment of AI, I think we would uh, at least be on the superhero side, not the villain side, on, on what we are trying to achieve. So Elif, what do you think about um, uh, Europe's approach? And do you think it will be possible going forward in this new digital era um, to uh, distinguish uh, jurisdictions uh, in terms of sovereignty and whether uh, with all these changes in the world and the uh, fast uh, fast track to future will we will, will uh, uh, whether we will see a new um, new world order okay <laughs> I know you mentioned you have some ideas in in your book so I would be uh, interested uh, to hear those. Okay, I think um, um, uh, you are mentioning uh, this, uh, the, the discussions related to the internet uh, fragmentation, for instance. Am I yes. right? Yes. There are some yes. new discussions. Okay. Um, I, uh, maybe My question I need... actually, I mean, yes, mm -hmm. EU is uh, working hard on this new regulation and um, it, I, in my opinion, as it happened in GDPR, it will have, it will affect the world in general, but at the end we are in a different uh, age, uh, digital age, and do, we don't know what the future will uh, bring us in terms of uh, possibility to regulate what's happening. 
Yes, I think uh, all these new technologies, they are, um, they are having a huge potential, I mean, but we don't know uh, what we do, we are going to do with this potentials. And I think your question is kind of related with this and to define uh, this discussions related to the internet fragmentation, I think we need to go a bit back like uh, to 1990s. And then uh, we need to understand how things um, has been changed on the internet. Uh, because uh, in the 1990s, uh, peoples, the, this, the peoples of this new place, if I may say, cyberspace, uh, the, the, this new space, uh, they think that the internet is immune from the uh, subversion powers. I mean, uh, the officials of the government, they cannot do anything on this new uh, space. Just, and I 20 years ago, you, no, no, 30 years 30, ago. 30, 30. Oh. <laughs> very, maybe ancient, very ancient thinking, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, for instance, uh, the very, very infamous John Perry Barlow's declaration of um, the, the declaration of independence of the cyberspace materialized all this understanding. But today we know that uh, it is not the fact, actually. And at this point, it can even be said that there is a transition from cyber utopias to cyber dystopias. And uh, of course, uh, it's really hard to define something as utopia or dystopia, because my utopia can be your uh, dystopia, but uh, I don't want to deep, uh, dig in this subject. But I mean that uh, today, um, the internet, uh, we, we know that uh, governments can inter intervene to the internet. And the internet remains our most important communication tool to express our views and reach the views of others. On the other hand, we see that states have intensive intervention in the internet. The level of this in intervention may vary from country to country, and we are increasingly encountering internet access restriction decisions, online, online monitoring, or even filtering activities on the internet backbone, like China. Uh, does. Moreover, uh, there are some discussions related to the internet fragmentation, as you indirectly mentioned, actually, and I may say that this constitutes, uh, this may constitute one of the most controversial issues uh, in terms of the internet in the upcoming years. Um, to define what is the fragmentation uh, of the internet, um, I may say that we frequently ask to ourselves that what will the internet access be like in the future? What will the online world, for instance, uh, look like as more people gain access to the internet and how will their lives alter as a result? But instead of this, maybe we also uh, need to ask another question. What will our internet be like in the future? And fragmentation is directly related uh, with this, with the fragmentation, which is also expressed as the balkanization of the internet, it is often expressed that states seek to apply their physical state borders in cyberspace. And the fragmentation of the internet can be defined as the transformation of cyberspace into a uh, space, into a space that changes within state borders to such an extent uh, that it uh, damages its global character, actually. And in this context, uh, several concerns are expressed. For instance, the internet, which brings people around the world together beyond national borders, uh, may turn into a space where nation state net networks are connected serially actually. Mm -hmm. We have lots of different uh, internets and they can connect to each other. And in such an environment, it is thought that each state's internet will take on uh, its own, own national characteristics. So um, 
I think uh, this is um, a question or this is a, a discussion point sometimes um, can be undermined, but I think it's an important uh, discussion topic. Too, yeah, um, normally we, we were we we, we were um, thinking that we are world citizens and uh, you know internet and cyberspace is our uh, world uh, where we all are we are all equal and um, free to uh, communicate but if there will be fragmentation different spaces and controls of countries uh, uh, and so on then we go back again uh, to our discussions on AI and see that um, that the protection towards government's regulation on um, uh, processing of people's uh, their people's data on an automated way can be harmful if they want to if there are conflicts like currently uh, we are uh, we are witnessing an ongoing conflict in the middle of Europe um, so that can be an unexpected um uh, maybe surprise for all of us because we we always thought uh, the cyberspace is a very peaceful and um a global environment but uh, with recent changes and um use of maybe uh, the uh, systems ai uh, um, or uh, similar systems can change this, this uh, very dramatically on in an unexpected way I don't want to be <laughs> pessimistic, uh, but uh, Vera, I mean, what do you see about the future? Uh, uh, what do you expect in terms of AI and its deployment and all these, you know, unexpected changes uh, currently we are uh, witnessing in the middle of uh, Europe as well? Uh, um, are you pessimistic or are you um, are you not <laughs> optimistic? Hopefully. <laughs> I'm generally a very um, optimistic person and I try to keep up my, my optimism every day, uh, despite also uh, concerning um, developments in the world. Yeah, um, I think the, the, the digital developments um, in, in the last uh, years and, and, and more than I think the internet was, was a, a, a game changer, they have brought the world closer together. Yeah, so I think um, that is a, a benefit that we should keep as 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 a, a, a as global citizens. Yeah, so I I find that very um, enriching to to discuss AI with you today. Yeah, with with different uh, representatives from from different countries. And just this morning, I I had a call with with a, a colleague from China who is based in, in Shanghai and we discussed the Chinese export control laws versus the EU export control laws. And I think that's, you know, just great to be able to call a colleague in Shanghai to see what he thinks about uh, latest developments and to compare, compare these developments uh, in, in Europe and China. Um, of course, geopolitical conflict sometimes then disrupt this uh, this um, global uh, communication also the global businesses I think the 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 recent developments in uh, and war in in, in Ukraine um, are an important example it's not the only one but it's an important example and suddenly communication with with Russia becomes very difficult. Uh, also, global supply chains are disrupted, and the economy is brought down. Apart from that, I don't want to touch upon, of course, all the human tragedy that is involved. Um, so, and and this has an effect on 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 economic growth uh, and also on 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 yeah on 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 the well-being of, of society. So, I think we need to be careful as a society also to um to continue to hold up human rights uh also in these circumstances so meaning that we cannot um renounce to these very important principles also in a situation of crisis this is i think um what a message that i i thought um we learned from or i thought i learned from 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 co from the covid crisis COVID. for example yeah that um 
I, I don't want to give up all my, my citizens' rights uh, uh, while we are having restrictions and, 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 and see the need for restrictions. We also need to balance them against other rights, for example. Yeah. So for example, um, if children cannot go to school because of the pandemic, we need to make sure that, that they can at least attend online classes. So we need to, to also overcome our, our data protection concerns with respect to uh, you know, digital technology, also to, to enable them uh, to, to participate and to meet their, their, their classmates and their teachers online. Yeah, so this is just an example. We also here need to balance their the interests in 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 having in not having you know my children's name on 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 Zoom versus uh, versus their participation in an online class. I think you need to balance that. And also another example is that um, in Germany, for example, we couldn't have a vaccination register for data protection concerns. Although I think um, there is really an, a societal benefit in having such a uh, a register. Um, of course, you, also there you need to balance rights and and and, and risks and and interests. Um, so it's never a, a, a straightforward decision. But I think you, uh, even in 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 even in in situations of of of, uh, of crisis, yeah, you need to be uh, you need to to hold up also the the, the various rights and continue to balance them and don't forget, you know, don't forget the law and don't forget and not place one interest over the other. I think that is what one what what we need to think about and, and continue to think about even if if uh, if, situ if, the, if times are difficult. Yes. Yeah. And this will then also help to to overcome the crisis. No, yeah, yes, especially I mean going back to our earlier discussions again with balancing the rights and, and, and um, doing um, impact assessments and, and testing uh, the, the, uh, uh, the balance. Um, again, I mean, this was a great example. Yes, uh, and we had the concern about uh, uh, data protection, but at the end of the day, children's uh, rights for, to education is at least in Turkey, but also in Europe, are, is protected under constitution so it's a constitutional right and it should be also respected so we uh, that's why the impact assessment process that it has so many aspects of it as lawyers or who are involved in all those processes we shouldn't only uh, focus on one um, one right one aspect of it but we should really think about multidisciplinary approaches and what can be the effects to to the uh, impacts of people's life not only from a data protection perspective because it's not an absolute right at the end of the day but in other aspects too um, in that sense i mean uh, we see also in the ai uh, act or um, in the, in some of the court cases the um, connection between consumers law data protection law um, anti anti discrimination uh, law um, and all those you know different concepts coming together um, uh, again competition law from a um, trade law perspective so those are all different actually disciplines but at the end of the day when we have to make an analysis we have to consider not only human rights not only uh, data protection um, uh, aspects but also other aspects of the um, of the matter uh, this is not an easy job for us too, but uh, I think um, understanding uh, the concepts and understanding what is uh, in the AI, what is meant, what is the purpose, going back to the uh, main principles, trying to figure out what, what do you want, what is the purpose, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, all this proportionality and other principles, they really uh, play a key role uh, for all of us to exercise our rights, but also uh, implement and uh, deploy new systems, new technologies, and be more innovative. Um, uh, Elif, from where you are, as a, as an author uh, of a new new book in uh, in digital era and and concepts, what is your conception on that? Um, you mean our future, or uh, yes. 
our feature from from today's eyes i mean look at people in 1990s they were they thought uh, internet brought freedom uh, obviously now we're discussing surveillance and whether we should be transferring data from europe to to us uh, due to heavy surveillance rules um mm -hmm. so it's it, things changed in in uh, in a in a in a very fast way so uh, we are now looking at things from our today's uh, knowledge, mm -hmm. probably, but uh, it's free to uh, dream about the future, I guess, for mm -hmm. all of us. Uh, first of all, you asked to vary out that. Are you a pessimistic or optimistic? I may, <laughs> I may say that I'm uh, trying to be um, a realistic, uh, optimistic person. <laughs> <laughs> so from this perspective, uh, I... I, I may say that I think the world is the same old world we know. I mean, in general terms, with all of its upsides and downsides. And uh, the human beings are also uh, not that different from the, uh, I don't know, 16th century from uh, today and 16th century, 17th century. We, uh, I always think that in any culture, at the very basics, we have very um, um, similar uh, expectations from uh, life. I mean, in basics, of course. Uh, but on the other side, uh, there are still some um, tragedies on the world. Unfortunately, we can see that the wars are still going on, as Vera also mentioned and that um, world peace has yet to be reached and we are suffering uh, the consequences of all of this. And in this, as in many other areas, I believe that new technologies have a transformative power and we can use it for good means maybe. However, I think making a precise prediction regarding which path this potential will Go is very challenging. So uh, I cannot predict that uh, th th these new technologies are just taking us to a better place, like the world peace that, like a world that we have world peace, and we also solve, for instance, the ecological problems, and we are going to have a better relationship with the other um, uh, living. Uh, animals and uh, the, the world, mm. the whole ecosystem, I mean. Uh, but still, I think there is a potential and if we use it in the right way, uh, I think there is no reason to be that pessimistic, at least. <laughs> uh, but uh, going back Very to the, there was there was a discussion about consciousness about uh, consciousness and, and robots. Um, and I remember, um, um, again, uh, our discussion about keeping it, uh, uh, accountability and who's going to be responsible for the actions of automated systems. Um, do you have any legal theory or explanation for possible responsibility issues, especially when it comes to robots or um, automated uh, um, uh, uh, machine learning systems. Um, are you asking this? Autonomous, to me? yes, to you. Yeah, okay. Oh. From a, do you, do you have a legal <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard I, question. So, okay. I, I, um, I think that actually uh, for now and maybe for the upcoming years, uh, we should not have some kind of uh, electronic responsibility or whatever we call uh, however we call it uh, I think this kind of uh, I mean putting the responsibility on these machines or algorithms or artificial intelligence is just um, serve to protect the real responsibles uh, about this um, devices at some point I'm, I'm talking about uh, today's technology of course so i think uh, there uh, there should be uh, some legal regulations related uh, legal regulations to solve this problem but i do not have any 
silver bullet or mm -hmm. any uh, miracle formula for this, I may say. Uh, but uh, of course, the producers, the owners, if they can, uh, the, the people who are using these technologies, uh, they can be also some kind of um, co-responsible uh, for some actions. But we need to, I think, as lawyers or uh, as lawmakers, we need to uh, define these uh, categories clearly. Otherwise, there will be lots of, there is actually lots of gray areas. And from a perspective of a lawyer, uh, it's not something that we like uh, because it yeah. can cause lots of um, vital legal problems, actually, if we have that much gray areas. But uh, for, uh, not, uh, not for 10 years, but if you ask this question for the next 50 years and so on, uh, I think there can be some uh, innovative kinds of uh, responsibility mechanisms. If the artificial the developments of artificial intelligence goes like this, we don't know actually. But maybe then we need something really new, some something very innovative. Mm. Mm. Um, what about you, Vera? <laughs> Yeah, I, I find that this is a very, very interesting question. But at the at, at the moment, I could not imagine uh, sanctions for or, or or responsibility of a system, you know, as such. Yeah, I don't think that it fits with with the the general legal concepts that we have. I think uh, the the, the the legal system at least as as i know it um is not is is based on 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 accountability and responsibility of of individuals so really natural persons so living persons um and 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 in some instances you can think of responsibility and and accountability of legal entities yeah so a, a group of persons in in whatever or in different forms yeah you, you can have companies being liable for something but for example in in germany it was heavily disputed and for the moment um it has been uh, it has not been accepted that legal entities can have criminal responsibility yeah so can really become criminally liable for for a certain behavior it's always a more an administrative form of of liability so they can have they can obtain uh, they can receive fines uh, or also orders you know like stop processing data mm -hmm. or remove this uh, this hazardous substance or things like that but um, it's never about uh, criminal sanctions and and so, 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 so placing responsibility on a, on a thing actually, yeah. So on a, on a, on a system seems very strange to me. Yeah. So I could not imagine it for, for the moment, but perhaps never say never. Yeah. Perhaps that at, at, at some point in, in future, um, we will, we will see something uh, new, a new, you know, an entire new concept. But I, I think for the moment, um, while also AI is still uh, developing and and, uh, and and I mean we are in a very early stage yeah, for the first time in Europe we will we expect to have a, a AI dedicated regulation so it's really a, a first first step. Um, I think at the moment we should not people, uh, developers of AI and users of AI sort of dig away from their responsibility. they should be responsible and, and, and 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 remain responsible also once they have created the AI and put it on the market. I think that is also a very strong signal from from this draft that it's the responsibility also continues. Yeah, so you cannot sort of make the AI here it is and then and then you run away. But it really, you have to watch it. You have to follow it. Um, you have to control it and and if if it turns out to have a, a bad impact you may may be responsible to take it from the market or improve it yeah so it's really a 
uh, control and responsibility over the whole life cycle of the product like for, exactly. for other actually like for other products uh, dangerous products risk based risk, risk products and uh, like other machines or, or the like yeah so 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 it's product product law actually yeah exactly yeah. and the, actually that's why i asked the question because in in icos uh, um, guideline uh, recently on AI, there was this section where they, there's a, there's a question, it says, how is an AI assisted decision different to one made by, uh, uh, made only by a human? So that was the question. And it says, one of the key differences is uh, who uh, an individual can hold accountable for the decision made about them. When it is a decision made directly by a human, it is clear that um, who the human can go in order to get an explanation about why they made such a decision. And where an, an AI system is involved, uh, the responsibility for the decision can be less clear and there should be no loss uh, of accountability uh, when a decision made with the help of or by AI system uh, rather than solely by a human. And um, where an individual would expect uh, an explanation from a human, they should in, uh, instead expect an explanation from the accountable, uh, for those who are accountable for an AI system. So that was, you know, that is exactly what you're um, saying. At the end of the day, we will go after the ones who were accountable for the AI system. And in that sense, uh, again, we need to really make sure from the beginning um, uh, development uh, design uh, of the systems to be involved. Uh, maybe uh, there are new roles in the companies now, um, uh, chief um, AI ethics officers uh, have those kind of roles when we um, have uh, uh, maybe very intrusive methods uh, make sure that we, we are on the right track. We are doing things responsibly. Um, this will be a question in upcoming years with the um, development of technology. Uh, we will somehow, I guess, in maybe five, 10 years time, we will be able to respond some of the um, this theoretical questions. But at the end of the day, it will come back and find the ones who designed it, who um, deployed it and it will be maybe a product liability issue or uh, uh, some other uh, liability, new liability uh, categories. Um, but we have to really um, from day, day one uh, in, be involved in the, uh, in the development. And I see, I think as lawyers, uh, we, should not, we should now be part of the innovators, not like usually lawyers are, they call it lag laggards, like the ones that um, uh, uh, use the technology, the last, um, uh, the, uh, but now we have to be part of innovators in order to assess these things uh, really from a, a, a legal point of view, because it will be too late when, when the products on the market, it should be really privacy by design, privacy that, uh, from, uh, from day one uh in order to protect the uh, humans human uh, um individuals rights and, and and privacy i guess mm. um there are there is a mu there are um activists uh in in europe like uh shrams the famous shrams and uh he's uh um uh, nyob none none of your business and we saw i think we saw several cases also initiated by them uh, as uh, claims uh, for automated uh, processing and, uh, and, and use of algorithms. Um, some of the cases are already uh, very public, uh, uh, Google Analytics and so on. But I think uh, in terms of processing, uh, enforcing our rights as individuals, uh, activist groups like NYOB have, uh, have played a very important role in Europe in development of case law. Uh, what do you think about that, Vera? Yeah, I know they are controversial, but <laughs> in terms of uh, uh, case law, I think there is a, a triggering effect coming from uh, some uh, human rights uh, activists or, uh, or groups uh, that they go and uh, they go um, after and complain about certain aspects. For example, there were cases 
on employment, uh, employees, uh, rights to uh, work uh, or rejection of their employment applications because of um, uh, automated decision-making systems without intervention of hum uh, humans. Um, these, these kind of decisions are coming more and more, especially from employment side. We see it uh, more uh, as complaints before the authorities. I don't know, I know Germany has a very strong uh, labor law and a very strong uh, precedent in, in, in labor matters. But do you, do you see that uh, in upcoming days more um, as, a, as a hot topic for uh, lawyers, privacy lawyers? Yeah, uh, indeed, indeed, as you say, um, in Germany, there's a strong tradition of uh, or a strong um, protection of employees by the by the labor law. Yeah, so the, the labor law is generally very protective of of, of employees. And um, we also, in addition to the to the law itself, um, we have uh, the institution of the what we call a, a works council. Yeah, so Betriebsrat. Um, which is a, a, a council, a group of, of people in larger companies that has the, the task of protecting employees' rights. And, and so, um, so I think that the, the protection of employees' rights generally in Germany is qu quite good. Yeah, so, um, so the law and also the, the way how it is uh, managed is quite protective. So in this area, I don't really see a need for, 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 for other groups to, to, to chime in and to, to, to enforce employees' rights. Yeah? So I don't think that this will be a trend, but um, one could imagine that con yeah, groups like uh, activists, like uh, None of Your Business or others, would would also see the see the, the regulations on, on artificial intelligence and other data related acts as a, as a as a chance also to promote uh, and to promote a consumers' rights and we see that for example in the field of data breaches um, yeah so whenever a larger company loses some data which is of course a a, a tricky situation then um, you see these mass claims coming in yeah so it's really also quite a financial risk in in in, in addition to all the hassle that you have with, with recovering the data and and all that um there is really a financial risk um also for companies from these mass claims yeah um so it's it's certainly possible uh, that that such groups may also try to enforce consumers' rights uh, with respect to, to to artificial intelligence. However, the I think the the, the artificial intelligence act, as it's currently drafted, it's um, as I said before, it's a product security piece of of legislation. Yeah, so it's not. It does not specifically. It, it does. It, it. I mean, it does refer to human rights and the protection of the individual in a lot of instances. But uh, it's not um, drafted as a as a piece of legislation uh, conferring individual rights to people. So I would expect, and, and it does not regulate data protection in the. It 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 yes. leaves that to the GDPR. Yeah. So I could imagine that that the GDPR will, will continue to be the, the basis for these data related claims and not the A AI Act. Yeah. Um, having said that, of course, I mean, if there is, um, if there, if, 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 if an individual is, is hurt, whether materially or immaterial by, by, by AI technology, there will be, I think, product related liability claims that that an individual um, could make yeah and um, in Germany at least um, we don't have that we don't have this instrument of, of class action so it would rather be um, individual actions uh, against uh, against the company um, so I think in AI act we see um, more a product based approach instead of process based or uh, approach right that's that's the outcome of it kind of, in a way. Um, 
product uh, product based um product focused or product or... focused so so classic i think classic instruments taken from from product surveillance Liability. laws in in other like for example i mean you have uh, you have a, a lot of uh, rules from from the eu law also on for example um Danger, so, so dangerous machines, yeah, or uh, machines that can explode, or that can that have high voltage, or other f are, are, are dangerous to people for for other reasons. And the same instrument uh, instruments that that the the respective product regulation uses to protect people against the, the the risks from these products that also applies here yeah for example um you have the ce marking yeah which which yes. um, needs to be applied sort of to the machine so to to certify that that it it complies with with laws and Standard. you have that that instrument of a third party certification process yeah and then um, you have market surveillance authorities to, to oversee this yeah. process. Um, these are all classic product product related um, instruments. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a good. In, I mean, when I when I uh, first read the AI Act, I, I thought it was a good approach because it makes it easier for um, general public to understand to um, uh, relate to the concepts much easily because we have this concept of product liability it's been there forever um there's case law about it uh, it's you know it, it is easier to understand and um uh, uh, and relate uh, more than an, it's not an abstract concept of liability so in in my opinion it helps people to also um, uh, uh, be aware of liabilities and processes and also enforce their rights from more familiar uh, legal uh, ways. Uh, that's why I found it um, more um, maybe easier to understand and uh, employ, but obviously we don't know how the practice will, uh, will develop. But I, um, what, what do you think about Elif, about this product uh, liability or product-based approach instead instead of process-based approach, if we can call it that way. Actually, um, it's really hard for me to say uh, something on this uh, because, as you mentioned, I'm uh, working on the public law department, so I think a civil lawyer uh, can make more. Uh, fruitful discussions on this uh, topic but um, i feel kind i i i'm a bit cautious about the ai act of eu i may say i hope uh, it will manage what it's uh, intended to do but uh, on the other hand if you think about the practice of this uh, regulations i think um, uh, there will be some problems and still there are lots of uh, critics about uh, the AI Act. Mm. Yeah, well, there are always discussions in Europe uh, between um, uh, regulators all the time. So it's not an easy process to uh, finalize a legislation which is applicable to all states, right? Uh, where it's really hard to <laughs> <laughs> eventually have it um but um i'm sorry Celine. i think we have two questions yes, in the, yes in the chat. exactly that's uh we have two questions one is what practical ai applications should lawyers be watching out for and what will be the uh, responsible ai standards for assessing impact at design time i think these are for you vera <laughs> maybe if you if you don't mind <laughs> you can start <laughs> yeah what practical ai applications should should lawyers be watching out for i think um when looking at a at an ai application the first thing to look at is i think the the impact for the for the individual and whether it would qualify as a as a very sort of very high risk high risk or low risk ai so i think to, to assess 
which which rights and interests of the individual could be concerned here i think that is uh, the most important to understand what what level of of um of safeguards you need to apply we don't have the ai act uh, at the moment but if you look at uh, at general gdpr rules or labor law implications if it if it's if it relates to to labor applicate labor um, relevant applications i think that is the, the 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 first thing to look at and then um for example um as i the the, the example that i quote the case that i quoted before which is about um registering emotional state for example yeah so really looking at and how do people feel is that are their emotions tracked yeah that is for example um, something which would be seen as intrusive and then is it look at the data sets that are employed to 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 train the ai uh, that is i think an, another uh, important thing um i think that already also results from 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 gdpr but it it will in future be a, a strict compliance requirement also uh, under the ai act so that you check is your data set um, is it biased? Yeah. How mm. how what data have you used to train or will you use to train the AI? It should be it should be complete. It should be fair. Um, it should have be should be collected in a in a in a certain manner. Um, perhaps you train two different sets of AI with different data sets. Compare the results. Um, so it is quite quite important to to control the data that that you feed into the AI. Yeah, I think these are the the, the two most important things um, which I could see um, that you should look out for, and um, and and which also defines the AI standards um, that you that you have to assess at the design time. Yeah, really, you have to do that upfront. Yeah, it's not not at a later point in time, um, but really understand how the AI works from the beginning of the, of the development process. And this also means for companies that you have to, um, uh, to have processes in place within your company that, uh, that bring the, also the, uh, really a diverse team of, of people together um, from different departments. Yeah. So you may from, from, legal and compliance uh, from from product development but also perhaps ethical uh, tech so data security um, representative so uh, quality management so really have a, a multidisciplinary team at the beginning yes. to, and and then also assess um, the product throughout its uh, its uh, development um, process and then really also document all these steps that you take so yeah. th I think that is important so that in in case you later on you 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 have a liability case you can really show that you have been aware of this risk that you have uh, discussed the risk and, and and balance it against other risks and chances yeah and then um, uh, and dealt with it so we have a very long uh, question here. You've discussed the nature of humans from both the historical and philosophical perspective and even included COVID. COVID. Um, you know, my question is this, AI has proven to be able to iter iteratively improve itself until becoming the world's best goal player. Do you think the same could happen to law and perhaps the other white collar jobs and does push us towards a new world order. Otherwise, do you see AI helping lawyers and hindering them or hindering them from if weaponized? Mm. <laughs> the, the, what, what do you think? Elif? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think um, um, beating a uh, um, go master or chess master on the board is uh, something different uh, from taking the job of a human being lawyer. 
because the in the first case there is a game and we know the rules of the game and we can understand who is the winner very easily i mean there are these rules and if you uh, met the check you you check the mate am i right in english i i need to translate yes. it in english if you uh, check the mate then you uh, will win the game it's go like this i think because i have a general idea about what is go i know the board but i do not know how to play it i just know that it is a board game uh, more complicated than chess and i'm a very uh, uh, junior i may say chess player and i know it's a complicated game anyway uh so uh, in this kind of board games we can understand who is the winner but for a legal discussion for instance for what we are doing related to for instance liable liability of ai uh it is not something like this so we cannot say that i think uh ai uh, defeated the lawyer in this sense. It's uh, because this um, all the parameters are different than the first case. On the other hand, I think uh, artificial intelligence um, may be used by lawyers uh, more frequently in the uh, next decade, maybe, or the or in the upcoming years. Uh, for just checking the relevant uh, case law or uh, something like this. But uh, I think we won't see, for instance, in 10 years that uh, some artificial intelligence technology is uh, going to judge us. I don't think that, it, uh, I, I think it won't be the case in the next 10 or 20 years. And I don't say this because of the uh, technology, because I, I don't say this uh, because I think that the technology won't be that developed. I say this because I think we are not ready this kind of things. I, I, I uh, in my personal view, it's not something that I prefer. So I do not want to be judged by solely artificial intelligence, but I need to mention that I uh, share this opinion. I, I don't share, I didn't share this opinion from uh, this perspective and with this feelings. Uh, if if I, uh, I keep being a realistic, optimistic, I may say that uh, people won't want to see, for instance, AI judges. I'm uh, almost sure for next 10 years, uh, and it's also a big probability for next 20 years, I think. Mm. But afterwards, I don't know. There can be <laughs> anything. As Vera said, never say never, so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so Vera, what do, you, what do you think about uh, uh, AI taking over our jobs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we have started seeing that, or we see we have seen, for example, in in due diligence processes, we have seen um, tools that scan contracts, for example, and review contracts and identify change of control clauses, for sure. example. Yeah, we we see that as an application, or we have used AI tools also to review large sets of data yeah just so for example if you have a, a email um in, inbox of a of a of an individual that is accused of of certain wrongdoing in a company yeah um you can review these emails to to find out what happened um of course i'm not discussing now the legal requirements to do that but if you do it then you can use search terms really uh, Fast, but you yeah. can also try to use an algorithm that helps you identify documents that are similar to a certain document for example that you have already found or that have certain criteria and that is actually quite helpful yeah because it it, it may help you to to identify such data uh, more easily and quickly and which is also a benefit yeah so um i i wouldn't see it critically but i think in 
at least the way I advise companies, it's always very individual cases. Yeah. So where it's really, you have to look at very specific circumstances. It's not um, like the a standard uh, process. Yeah. So, uh, so, so I don't personally feel them, but in mass, mass claims, mass processes where the, the cases are very similar, very small also, um, it may be helpful to, to, to use these technologies, yeah. But this is just the lawyers. I agree with Elif completely on the, on the judges. Yes. Uh, uh, I, 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 I'm hoping <laughs> not to see any, <laughs> any, because that is there, I think, again, it's important that, that decisions are not, you know, are not taken very uh, just on 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 a they they need to look at the individual circumstances yeah so you would never um, have a, a fully a comprehensive assessment of of a of a case if 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 you just applied certain predefined criteria yeah mm -hmm. so um, so in these cases I, I would hope that we don't get yeah. <laughs> robot judges. Yeah. I think um, I, uh, we will, I think, um, listen to this uh, record in uh, 10 years time and see if we were right or wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. It, will, it will be lots of fun. So um, I don't know how we uh, have time passed so fast. Um, thank you, Elif. Thank you, Vera, for um, joining us today. And also Lara for joining us in the first half. Uh, it was a pleasure to um, discuss with you this crazy um, new world and um, uh, the new uh, digital era. Uh, there is more to discuss, obviously, a lot to mo more um, learn, uh, but uh, it is, uh, it's great to be um, with you um, on an all-female panel uh, <laughs> today to um, look to the future, try to understand, try to make sense of uh, things. Um, I, I, I really feel very privileged. Um, so thank you again. Um, thank you um, to all of our, um, uh, all the participants today. Uh, we're looking uh, forward to having you again uh, uh, for future events. We will be sharing um, um, upcoming events via our uh, LinkedIn pages on Uzbek Attorney Partnership and on uh, kp.consulting uh, uh, LinkedIn pages. Um, have a wonderful day for, for everyone joining in uh, from the US and good afternoon and uh, have a lovely evening for all of us in the Euro in Europe. Okay. See you next Thank time. You. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Bye. 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 Bye.